coming up next on Business Minds Coffee Chat. It's pretty counterintuitive because if you read the the self-help literature, it's, you know, positive, think your way and banish your inner critic and kick that naysaying thought distortion part of you to the curb. But that doesn't work. You can't fight with yourself. If you fight with yourself, there's you're never going to win. And I think all of us, to some degree, know that feeling of fighting with. But if you think about it, it's like. Who's doing the fighting and who's doing the listening? We get so concerned with how negative our thoughts are that it doesn't occur to most of us, myself included, until I learn this. Maybe have a conversation with that part of you. That sounds so like woo and esoteric. It's really not. We hear ourselves think thoughts all day. We talk to ourselves all day. I'm simply suggesting maybe you up-level the communication skill. The fact that you're listening to this podcast tells me that you're someone who values their time and is interested in improvement and growth. I've learned over the years that those who want to get better, who want to sharpen their skills, hire coaches. I started my coaching business because I saw firsthand how having the right coach transformed a family member's business and life. This had a profound impact on me, and it's my mission to help others have a similar positive experience. If you've ever thought about hiring a business coach, check this out. Working with me as your coach, you'll gain more clarity on your goals and priorities, be held accountable, learn and apply the tools to maximize your potential, build a rock-solid foundation for your business, and achieve the results and success you deserve. Warren Buffett said, The best investment you can make is in yourself. If you're ready to commit to your personal and professional development, let nothing hold you back. To apply to my coaching program and to schedule a call with me to learn more, just visit jshearbusinessconsulting.com and click the Book Now button at the top. I look forward to hearing from you. And now, enjoy the latest episode. Hi, this is Britt Frank, psychotherapist and author of The Science of Stuck, and you're listening to Business Minds Coffee Chat with Jay Shear. This is Business Minds Coffee Chat, where those interested in personal and professional growth come to listen to and learn from extraordinary business leaders, thought leaders, best-selling authors, renowned psychologists, neuroscientists, and others who are changing the world through the work they do. I'm your host, Jay Shear. Welcome to the conversation. Wayne Dyer said, You are not stuck where you are unless you decide to be. Well, on today's episode, we talk about the science of stuck, understanding anxiety and how it's a superpower, the myth of motivation, self-leadership, the formula for success and the freedom to enjoy it, and more. My guest is a licensed neuropsychotherapist, a trauma specialist, an expert in human behavior, keynote speaker, author, an award-winning adjunct professor at the University of Kansas, and some may say a stand-up comedian. She's a contributing writer to Psychology Today, and her work has been featured in major media outlets, including NBC, NPR, Fast Company, and Forbes. Please welcome the woman who's helping us get from stuck to go, Britt Frank. Britt, it is so wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me on. I can't believe you put the stand-up comic bit in the intro. You are the first. So, yes, thrilled to be here. (laughs) Beautiful. Well, why don't we start off with that? Why don't you tell us about your stand-up comedy experience and how that all happened and what you learned about yourself? So I think the art form of stand-up comedy has so much to teach us, whether you're an entrepreneur, a business person, a creative person, or just a human with a brain and a pulse. The skills required to stand up with a microphone and nothing else and captivate an audience and make them laugh, I think those are just good skills for life. And in the world of public speaking, stand-up is the Everest 
of that particular genre. So that's been a bucket list thing for me. Um, I did it once. I don't know if I would do it again, but it was a wonderfully terrifying growth experience. Mm, I love that. Wonderfully terrifying. What a great descriptive word. So just to give us a bit more context, how long had you been prepping for this and what was the what what was the reason that you did it? Was it something to overcome a, a fear? You mentioned bucket list. To just give us a bit more background on that. So a lot of my work focuses on taking the leap and expansion and doing the things that are hard. So I sort of need to practice what I preach. And the thing that scared me the most at the time was doing stand-up comedy. And it just so happened, as life tends to do, um, a friend of mine, a dear friend, Becky Blades, her daughter writes for the John Oliver Show, and they host a female stand-up evening, and I was invited as one of the comedy muggles, one of the newbies who's not really versed in the art form, to give it a go. I had a lot of help, a lot of seasoned pros vetting my bits, so in terms of if you're going to try stand-up, that's the best possible circumstances under which Beautiful. to do so. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> well, thank you for giving us a, a little peek behind the curtain there. So, you know, I thought a good starting point for us would be for you to share with all of us what your favorite thing is about yourself and why. Mm. Oh, the therapist in me wants to ping that back to why do you ask your guests that convert, you know, that question? The, my favorite thing about myself is that I am a hot mess of a human who just happens to also have a shiny degree and a horrible drug history. So I like the, the that I have both the front facing professional credibility and the behind the scenes sort of sorted gritty Dateline NBC backstory. I find that makes me very human. Mm, that's great. It sounds like a beautiful life to me. It is now. I wouldn't trade it. Good, good. Well, we're going to explore that a bit more deeply. So, you know, I, I would love it if we could wind the clock back a bit and talk a little bit about your upbringing, about your familial relations, some things that maybe you learned early in life that you carry forward and things that have shaped the person who you are today. So take, take us back as far as you think is appropriate. And I, I would love it if maybe you would share a few things that you learned from your mother and your father. Oof. <laughs> Let's see, how much trouble do I want to get myself into? Well, you know, as a trauma specialist, I really can see now that that word, and that word has become sort of buzzy in the zeitgeist, and it's become watered down and has lost a lot of its meaning. But I think for me, I fell into a category that a lot of people can identify with, which is nothing really looked like it was wrong. Growing up, my parents were married. I never had to worry about was there food on the table? Were we going to be evicted? All of the basic life needs were met. All of the boxes were checked. And so what's my problem as I enter adolescence and then college that I'm making these really curious choices that my life looked fine on paper as a child? What's my problem? But I later learned through my career and personal recovery, there's a lot of ways for humans to get dinged up. And just because my life didn't look that bad, and it wasn't, doesn't mean that there weren't a myriad of places where I got dinged up and injured. One of which being, my I didn't come from a feelings family. No one talked about what was going on inside. It's, you know, you do your thing. You execute, you perform. And as long as you're performing, then we're fine. I got good grades. I was, you know, quiet. I read a lot. And so everything was fine. Didn't realize that we have this entire thing called a brain in our head and it informs our nervous system and therefore our behaviors and choices and that was news to me so I learned a lot of wonderful things from my family of origin but they missed quite a few of the really pertinent lessons so no shame no blame it's not about blaming family it's about acknowledging impacts and I think a lot of people would do well to really look at the impact of our upbringing and know that you don't need to blame your parents or get mad at anyone to go yeah we missed a few things along the way even the best parents are human no humans are perfect absolutely and neither are we right we're always on a journey mm -hmm. of exploration and, and growth and 
looking to to get better when we can and where we can. So speaking of not coming from a feeling family, in your early years, did you have friends that you were surrounded by where you were learning about feelings, where maybe others were sharing those types of, of feelings and experiences and, and you weren't or maybe didn't quite know how? Yeah, I always felt like I uh, got sent out of the human factory without all of the pieces. Mm. So growing, that's why I became obsessed with psychology and the study of humans. It wasn't out of an altruistic desire to help people, even though I'm thrilled that that's a benefit. It was more, I don't understand how people people. I don't understand how the human brain brains. I was very lonely and isolated growing up didn't have a lot of friends. Um, my family, in addition to not being feelings literate, was quite boundaryless. So there wasn't a lot of, this is me, this is my body, and it belongs to me, and you are a separate person, and here's where, you know, I like this. You know, it's the classic give grandma a hug or she'll be sad situation. You know, that's the yeah. light end of that spectrum. Um, and so I just didn't understand how to be in relationship with people. I was good at school. And so because of that, and I don't know why I got that particular gene, but being able to escape into fantasy land and books gave me a very much needed out. It also gave me the great power of dissociation that I didn't really break. I didn't come into my body until maybe my 30s. It's like, oh, yeah, this head that we walk around in is actually attached to an entire mechanism. I and mean, it's helpful to know how it all works. It's like having an awesome car. But if you don't know how to drive, you're not. It's not going to go well. Yeah, pretty amazing discovery, isn't it? <laughs> oh my goodness! Yes. <laughs> so, uh, since you enjoyed reading books, and that was kind of a sounds like a refuge for you, what were some of the types of books that you were reading? So, was it? Uh, you, I think you mentioned the word fantasy. Uh, what? What? Give me. Give me an example. What were some titles that you were reading early in life that just really? enabled you to get lost in those god so for people of my generation who read the vc andrews series which were these horrific dark twisted tales of family dysfunction and like if you think of the family dramas that we like on tv now like uh, the Sopranos or Billions or whatever. Um, the V.C. Andrews series, looking back, were so twisted and so dark. It's like, no wonder I ended up becoming a psychotherapist. Like, with that <laughs> as the starting point, like, what? Stephen King, I was obsessed with the darker, the better, the more messed up. And actually, true crime and murder porn, as they tend to call it in culture, you know, People are obsessed with true crime shows. If you look on Netflix, what's the obsession with all of this? For some people, including me, it's a very, very loud amplification of dysfunction that's easily seen. Like, it's, mm. it's easy to look at that and go, murder is bad. So clearly, that's not good. My situation is really hard to pin down. I know something's wrong. I don't really know what's. But I can see on that show or in this book, murder is happening. Murder is bad. So I think it makes things very easy to see. And for some, that's comforting in a twisted way. Now, do you still enjoy those types of, of books and shows and whatnot? Or has your genre shifted and changed? I cannot tolerate. I have such a highly sensitized system, so I have to be really careful about the types of media I ingest and watching crime shows and listening to There's nothing wrong with it. If that's your thing, have at it. But I do not read those types of things, and I do not watch them either. Interesting. Okay. So a shift has occurred. And you have you, you certainly have a much better understanding today of the type of things that can draw you in, things that you have to watch out for and maybe establishing some boundaries around those things. <laughs> It's interesting. I think Dr. Thema said it. Um, I hope I'm attributing credit properly. But she said, if your idea of a relaxing evening is to watch three hours of SVU, perhaps we want to look at how that set of software got installed. I'm paraphrasing her. But why is it relaxing to us to watch people get murdered? It, it really shouldn't be. <laughs> I totally agree. That's a great point. So I have found and, and push back on me if you disagree, but I have found through my own experience and those that I work with that often there are, are moments that happen in life that 
can define us. They can change the course of our lives. What is one of those moments that you personally have experienced? Mm, I have so many. I have lived so many lives this life. I think a big defining moment for me was one coming to terms with the, the perfect happy childhood that I had convinced myself that I had was not in fact real. And again, no blame, no shame, just reality check. If your life is looking like this and these are your choices, the likelihood that things were perfect is nil. So that was a life, I remember I was in my late 20s and a therapist said to me, you know, that's not normal. I'm like, what are you talking about? Everyone's family, you know, does this and that. Nope, sure don't. So I had to come to terms with that. Another life defining moment was walking away from a pretty serious drug addiction and a very violent, chaotic series of relationships. It's like, no, I'm fine. Everything is fine. It's really not. So people who look at, you know, people who get stuck in domestic violence situations or abusive situations, it's really easy to look and be like, well, obviously that's bad. So why don't they leave? But people don't realize that you don't start off by waking up going, I think I'm going to destroy my life today. But little teeny tiny shifts over time add up to a very big problem. And luckily, small choices may get us in trouble, but small choices also built a better life. So mm. yay, on both counts. So, so well said. So I want to pull back the curtain on that aspect of your life a bit, a bit more because I think it... First, I appreciate your your being candid uh, in researching you. You, you. you just you're you're so raw, so real, and so relatable. So you, you kind of mentioned at the beginning about you know trying to figure out how to how to do the human thing, right? I, I just I look at you today. And of course, you know, I see a snapshot of where you are today, and there's a lot of work that's led to the person who you've become, as it is with many of us. But I feel that you do human very well today in the way that you're able to articulate your story in a way that it's meaningful and adds context to the work that you do and why you're so brilliant at, at the work that you do. So let's let's stay there for a, a, a bit. So take us back again. So you, you graduated from Duke University and on paper things are, to the outside world, you, you look like you've got it all together. And to some degree you probably did have a lot of things together. But at this point, from what I understand, you also joined a fundamentalist Christian cult. You left home and you moved, what, to the other side of the country? What was going on in life at that point that that felt like it was the right thing to do? It's a pretty wild departure. So I grew up in a very stereotypically Long Island, Jewish, New York type of family, and I grew up in the 80s. And so the one thing that you can't do growing up in that system you can come home and proclaim that you're now only going to eat purple food or you can be as liberal as you want or you can be whatever. The one thing you're not allowed to do growing up in a Long Island Jewish family is anything that has to do with Christianity or Jesus, at least in the orbit that I grew up in. And so the best way to rebel was to move as far away as I could and become as fringy as I possibly could. You know, I'm not going to just go to church. I'm going to join a cult. So living in Northern California with people who said, if you do this, read this, wear this and think this, we will love you and we will accept you. And the appeal of cult life, even for intelligent people, you know, for anybody, I shouldn't say even for intelligent people, but I've heard like, you are smart. How'd you get sucked up on that? It's like, we all have reasons that we do all of the things and there are no fundamentally like dumb people. Everything makes sense in context. If you get to know some, if you look at someone's file up close, it all makes sense. For me, it was, I want to bypass the process of becoming a person. 
I, someone tell me how to do it. Somebody tell me what to do, and that will give me access to the things that we need, like belonging and connection and community. It's a counterfeit version, but counterfeit looks really appealing when you're in a deficit. And so rather than deal with my feelings, someone said, if you do this, then you'll be good. So I did until I started thinking for myself, at which point cult life is not sustainable. And how long were you involved in this cult? Off and on for years, a couple of years. I okay. was fortunate that I wasn't in the type of cult that grabs you and doesn't let you go. Mm. I was more in the, if you diverge from us, we will shun you. So I was popped out nearly as fast as I popped in. So I would say three to four years of that. Now, during that time, and, and you mentioned about having the need for belonging and connection, and you talked a little bit about your, your upbringing there. Were your parents still connected with you? Was there communication happening? Was there questioning, why are you doing this? Come home, those sorts of things. I've always been the black sheep of my family mm. and their approach to me generally has been to sort of shake their head and there's Brit doing Brit things again. So, okay, you know, whether it's stand up comedy or joining a call, that's all pretty par for the course for how I do me. So they didn't really have a, I didn't tell them about the darker, grittier stuff. So they didn't know that was going on. Um, and the cult thing, they're just like, okay, you know, do your thing. Have at it. So. But yeah, I that's interesting. One cult for another. Yeah. 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 So, you know, when I think of a uh, modern Jewish family, I, I, I think of a very tight knit, you know, family that, uh, you know, there's there's obviously the Jewish guilt side of that as well, right? But but uh, you know, tight families that that have dinners together and are you know, high expectations around things. What were the expectations that you had for yourself at this stage in life? So the, the tight knit, let's be together every day for dinner looks great for some families. If you scratch below the surface for others, you'll find a big mess of boundarylessness. And boundaryless families are very similar to cults in that they're a closed system. And the general modus operandi is don't think, don't speak, don't feel. So you do what's expected, you do what you're told. The rules are different when you're in a fundamentalist cult as when you're growing up on Long Island in a Jewish family. But the rules are absolute, at least in my system for me. And so it was very similar. It really didn't feel like that much of a departure. But I clashed with my family of origin. And so I was like, well, where can I find love and belonging, connection and acceptance as fast as I can? And whether it's drugs or compulsive doom scrolling or gambling or cult life, the search, the thing in us that makes us seek that out is pretty universal. Not all of us do the stuff I did, but this desire to feel seen and known and to matter is a very human thing. I just found really extreme ways of getting that met because I didn't want to deal with my feelings. So as do most of us, many that, of us. That is very true. That's uh, one that I am consistently trying to work through <laughs> and learn to be a more feeling and emotional human being. And I'm better than I was. So I'll <laughs> tell you a quick funny aside. So when I, just before I got married, my wife and I had met with the person who was going to officiate the marriage. And he said to my wife, my then fiance, you know that People call your fiance Stonewall, and I'm like, oh, that was a great thing to say. <laughs> and but but it was true, right? I mean, I had such a somewhat of a stone exterior, you know, it, 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 and it all related to feelings and emotions. And I just I would push everything down, and I didn't show a whole lot on my on my face. So we're always learning, right? I love so, that. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> it, it, is, it is my pleasure. If it helps somebody, fantastic. So at this point, so you, you, you leave the, the cult, and you've mentioned about 
drug addiction. Is this is this the the timeline where this really began to enter your life, or was this prior to this cult that you were involved with? I really wish sometimes, I don't have any regrets over my life, but I do wish I had more of a clean timeline because it wasn't like, this was my cult year and this was my drug year and this was my this year. There were a few years of cult life and then how did you get out of the cult? I followed a boy who happened to be addicted to drugs and so then I got into drugs and when that relationship blew up as those do, then I went and did other things and then I went back to the cult and then I went into the cult of workaholism and I sort of be bopped around these different comfort seeking types of behaviors but there wasn't really a neat and clean break they all sort of merged together how did I justify being in a cult and smoking meth and you know being in a violent relationship our brains are masterful at helping us not know what we know or helping us to pretend like we don't know what we know I've since learned it's a lot easier to just know what you know and feel what you feel than try to obfuscate the whole process because that just creates a mess. Absolutely. But uh, it, it sort of all came to a fever pitch. And then I had a moment in a bathroom with a meth pipe in my hand. I said, it's not really an addiction if other people are with me. It's sort of like calories don't count if you're eating someone else's french fries kind of thinking. Oh, and that. so <laughs> that... We can all relate to that. But I was alone. It was like five in the morning and I had the pipe in my hand and it was sort of like all the little voices gathered together in their boardroom inside my head. And they're like, we've reached a unanimous decision. You are not okay. None of this is okay. Time to change. And that was really the pivot point for me. Wow. At, at any point during this phase, did you ever feel like you were going to die? <sighs> I wished I would often. Um, there were a few moments where I almost did, but I didn't have the, that survival instinct of run away from the stuff, you know, animals in the wild when confronted with danger are programmed to go the other way. Trauma will make you run towards the fire instead of away. And so even though I was in danger often, it didn't occur to me like, this is not good. Maybe you should leave. So Human brains are complex, much more so than animals. Like, there's the danger, run. We don't do that always. So, no. And yes. So then let's let's move the, the timeline, which I know is not perfect, right? This kind of goes to the point that life is not linear. <laughs> and talk about how so so this this internal board of directors is saying this this is a problem right it's time to make a change what was the what was the big change for you so therapy what did it look like and how long did it take you to really start to feel like you were turning a corner mm. So the biggest change was stopping my efforts to make big changes. I have since learned our human brains don't like big. They don't like big anything. Too much of anything, even a good thing, is going to register in our brains as threatening and bad. And so the way to, I don't like the word hack, like hack your brain, like it's your brain, you don't have to hack it, it's on your side. But if we're gonna use that language, the best hack for big change is through what I call micro yeses. Not just baby steps, stupid small steps, like smaller than a baby step. That is what allows you to build momentum because it's, you know, I don't know when this will air, but New Year's resolutions tend to fall by the wayside. Why? It's not because everybody is lazy and unmotivated. It's because we all shoot for huge changes and our brains fight us on that and they win. But if you make tiny microscopic changes over time, those do build a life. And so it was sort of that old proverb, you know, chop the wood, carry the water, chop the wood, carry the water. And then you look around and you realize my life doesn't stink anymore. I didn't really realize I turned a corner until life was good. I was just like head down, do the next right thing. What's my next micro? Yes. Like tiny. Some days it was get out of bed. Some days it was take a shower. Some days it was don't call that person. Other days it was launch a business and shoot for bigger things using that same micro yes strategy. But I don't know. It wasn't that long ago, really, where I'm like, oh, my life's really good now. That's cool. But if you look around at how much work there is to do, most people would say, no, I don't want to do it. It took it took years. And 
during this time, during these years of doing this work, at, at any point did you did you fall backwards? Was it take a step back, take two steps forward, or were you always focused on moving forward? I was always focused on moving, but the moving was like take three steps forward and then be just a total like what head bangs on wall what are you doing girl and so it was five steps forward 20 miles backwards six miles to the side it it was all over the place and then eventually i got on a trajectory that was sustainable and that was through again really small 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 choices simplifying my life going back to basics and then once i got the hang of that, then I could do bigger things. And that sustained me for longer. But it, mm. I don't, I know no one who is like start to finish linear straight up. It, it very rarely works like that. And if it does, it comes at the expense of a lot of things that tend to pop up once you reach success. It's like, wait a minute, I got the thing I wanted. Why am I so unhappy? Says the story of many, many people. And that's why. So true. So were you... <laughs> Were you doing this work on your own? And if not, who was in your corner at this point? I was very fortunate that I had access to good therapy and, you know, the privileged position of being able to get what I needed in terms of I got to do some inpatient treatment short term. I had some really skillful therapists that practice the type of therapy I'm now trained in. Um, but when I was in the cults, I actually stumbled upon this book by Dr. Richard Schwartz, who created uh, the internal family systems model, which I'm trained in. And I should have been reading my my end times pray for the end of the world thing in revelations but instead i'm reading this book on internal family systems and it talked about all these different parts of us you have a part of you that really wants to do good things and you have a part of you that wants to lay on the couch and do nothing and he demystified the chatter in my head so much so that that really that book just in the middle of the forest that book showed up and that book put me on the trajectory that led me here. And he blurbs The Science of Stuck, which was so beautifully circular as far as yeah, I'm Yeah, I, I thought that was amazing. And, and when you talk about this and The Science of Stuck, it really it, it opened my eyes. It, uh, it's, it's quite a remarkable piece of that, that chapter where you start to, to discuss this in greater detail. So, you know, since you touched on that chatter in your brain and self-talk. I I, want to talk about that for a moment. And when you're working with someone who has just a a tremendous amount of negative self-talk, and we we all have negativity, right? We all have those, that that voice that tells us, you know, you can't do this, you're not good enough for this, you know, etc. It it seems like with with some people, it, it can be on a very elevated level. So when you're working with someone, how do you help them either manage that self-talk or or counter it? What are some of the the tools and strategies that that we can use to help us work through that negativity? It's pretty counterintuitive because if you read the the self-help literature, it's, you know, positive think your way and banish your inner critic and kick that naysaying thought distortion part of you to the curb. But that doesn't work. You can't fight with yourself. If you fight with yourself, there's you're never going to win. And I think all of us, to some degree, know that feeling of fighting with. But if you think about it, it's like. Who's doing the fighting and who's doing the listening? We get so concerned with how negative our thoughts are that it doesn't occur to most of us, myself included, until I learn this. Maybe have a conversation with that part of you. That sounds so like woo and esoteric. It's really not. We hear ourselves think thoughts all day. We talk to ourselves all day. I'm simply suggesting maybe you up-level the communication skill. How would you talk to a friend, you know, if you were fighting with them? You're not going to tell them to just leave. Well, some people would. But inviting the inner critic in for a dialogue, you know, I tell people, imagine you're the CEO of a company and you have no choice but to make this work. You can't fire. You can't riff. You can't do anything but train everyone up. 
what are you going to do? You start by seeking to understand what's motivating this inner critic. What what are they really worried about? What's their goal? What what are their strengths? How can we take this very negative, toxic type of person and train them up to become a powerful ally? And it, it's you know the work I do is sort of you reorg your, your the voices in your head and put them in better jobs that are better suited for their roles. The inner critic is a fabulous ally if properly trained and coached. You know, I, I love this, the way that you're explaining this. And you when you talk about this in the book, um, is it the term, is it idiotism? Iliism. I, I might have, I, I, yeah. Thank you, iliotism. So tell us what iliotism is and how we can use the third party in conversation with ourselves to be of benefit to us. It's my disclaimer here is this sounds bonkers. It sounds so fringy. It's not. It's like it's you don't need a neuroscience degree to know you would likely never talk to someone you care about the way you talk to yourself. So when you speak to yourself in third person, you're going to naturally have less of an edge, be less aggressive, which therefore will send less stress hormones shooting through your body. When you yell at yourself, your brain doesn't differentiate between you and someone else. And so then your stress response gets amplified. So it just means instead of saying, oh my God, I'm so buried by what I have on my plate today. It's So there's a part of me and she's feeling really overwhelmed. Okay, Britt, who feels overwhelmed, let's talk about it. You know, what's going on? How can I help you? It's so uncomfortable and unnatural. But my argument is if the normal way worked, it would have worked. The normal does not mean it's optimal. Third person's uncomfortable, but it works and science says so. Yeah. Did you, did you hear that, people? You know, for all of you that are watching and listening right now, I, first of all, I certainly hope you're taking notes because I definitely am. And it's important that you're not only listening, right, but you are, are taking that information and you're putting it down on paper and then you are actually applying what you're learning. And I, I remember when I first read this in the book, and, and I had heard something a little similar before in the past. And it is uncomfortable if you've never done it before. I mean, I had to, I'm had practicing it over and over again and having to remind myself, right, when I have those, those thoughts, I have to remind myself, okay, it's about communication. Let me change the way I'm communicating with myself. So I, I appreciate you explaining that to us. And uh, but to your point, it is science backed and it does work. And you know, and you mentioned about the fact that it can create that 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 space, right? Uh, which you know we talk about, um, like man's search for meaning and Viktor Frankl, and that our 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 power is found in that that space. And whenever we can create that space somehow, we have the option of choice, right? We can decide what we're going to do next. So great, thank you for explaining that to us. So I'm curious with all that you have been doing and all the work that you've done, not only on yourself, but the work that you do for others, what are you doing today to challenge yourself to continue to 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 grow both personally and professionally <laughs> besides standing up on a stage in a club and doing a bit trying to make people laugh that's fun yes. um so i'm actually working on a new book i haven't announced this yet but i just signed today so it's a it's a book actually about parts work and about training your inner critic and aligning the inner board of directors and doing all of this and making it less academic and less therapeutic and more this is just a better way of communicating with yourself all this communication stuff doesn't have to be with couples it can be with yourself um, i also do um aerial circus arts i found that the one place my brain chatter quiets down is if i'm hanging upside down and spinning around really fast because i get motion sickness and i'm scared of heights so doing circus arts is a great challenge for me wow. on every level so yeah okay, okay so i i can't let that <laughs> one go <laughs> how did you stumble across aerial circus arts yeah it's uh, it's like Cirque du Soleil people, I think, are another species. But I went to a show of 
normal looking humans doing extraordinary acts of circus acrobatic stuff. And I'm like, what is this? You know, these are adult people who are doing these things, not at the level of Cirque du Soleil, but at a level that was still mind blowing. Um, Sign me up. So I found the school. I started taking lessons. After a few years, I auditioned for their their training company where all the students get to do. And so like I do street. It's fun. I'll practice therapy during the day, give a keynote speech and then put on my superhero outfit and do the high flying stuff at night. It's very Uh cool. Oh, I love that so much. That is so amazing. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> so, you know, you talk about anxiety being your superpower. It sounds like you've got a number of superpowers uh, within <laughs> yourself. So, you know, speaking of anxiety, obviously we've we've touched on that to a degree, and it's a big part of your book, The Science of Stuck. How is how is anxiety a superpower? Mm. Again, controversial take. I don't like anxiety. I know no one who enjoys the feeling, but we get so hypnotized by the discomfort of anxiety that we forget it has a function. Anxiety is the check engine light of your brain's dashboard. The light is not the problem. It's a problem. And certainly anxiety left unchecked can become a medical crisis and debilitating. But anxiety is a messenger. And when you become fluent in the language of your brain, you realize anxiety is just a really annoying messenger with a really important message to deliver. And again, it puts you back, as you said, in the position of making choices. If you understand what anxiety is doing on your behalf, then you can design your life instead of living in default. So we all want to live by design and not by default. Anxiety is a problem. It's a point. It's a pointer. It's saying you have a problem here. But I could cut the check in. You know, when I was in my late teens, I would put, you know, the duct tape over the check engine light so I wouldn't have to see it when it went on because I couldn't afford whatever needed to happen. But that doesn't solve the problem. So getting rid of anxiety is not the goal. It's decoding the message. So then you can tee up a set of choices that will then lead you either towards yourself. Ultimately, if you want to boil it all down, all of our choices either lead us toward ourselves or away from ourselves. And I want to march towards myself. At least now. Fantastic. And I want to talk about the myth of motivation here for for a, a minute or two. This is this is a really interesting one to me. I believed, I, you know, I was a very motivated person. I studied motivation and thought that it was the almost the end all be all to the way we should be living life. Talk about the myth of motivation from your perspective and how you explain it in your book and through the research that you've done. Why is it a myth? And I'm not anti-motivation. So all the motivation research, all the motivation people teaching it, yay. I love the feeling of motivation too. It's fantastic. And Motivation is not required to make changes. Motivation is not required to do big things. Motivation is not required to do anything. You need willingness. You don't need to feel like anything to be able to do everything. And that's important to know. If I waited till I felt like it, I didn't feel like quitting drugs the day I quit drugs. I didn't feel like quitting my relational patterns that, you know, the day I did. There are some days where I don't feel like writing 3,000 words, but I do. Motivation is the thing that happens after you start. Like once you start doing something, then you unlock the motivation feeling that allows you to keep going. But we get tripped up by motivation at the starting gate. Once we're out of this, it's it's the age old thing of once I get to the gym, I'm fine, but I can't make myself go. It's like, great. You don't need motivation to get to, to the gym. What you need is, and this comes back to the micro yes thing. You need to find a yes that is so small that your system will allow you to do it. So a micro yes will release a micro dose of micro motivation, if you will. And then after you get going, then you get momentum and then momentum is what carries you through. You don't need motivation to build momentum. And then once you have momentum, motivation becomes irrelevant. If you have it, great, but you don't need it. Yeah, it becomes like a flywheel, right, where it automatically yeah. takes care of itself. It's the momentum that just keeps building. So to use your example of going to the gym and the micro yes, one tiny yes could be just setting out a uh, – 
pair of gym clothes or a set of gym clothes on your dresser the night before, not even doing anything, but right, but just putting them there on the dresser. That could be maybe a first micro yes, and then maybe the next step could be putting on a pair of shoe, a pair of running shoes or something. Is that the, the direction that you're you're heading? Exactly. And everybody pushes back on me with this and says, how am I supposed to do anything if I'm taking steps this small? And the answer is a lot faster than doing what you've been doing, which is trying to shoot for the moon and landing on your face. Micro yeses are not very cool looking. You're not going to live tweet or Instagram reel that you put your shoes on and then went back to bed. But Micro yeses build the momentum that you need to get going. New Year's resolutions would work fine if everyone took the micro step instead of I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. and run six miles. That's not sustainable. That's why no one does it. So big, big, giant goals are built with momentum and you get momentum with micro yeses. Yeah, so I am a huge advocate of it, it's not fun, but do it anyway. Totally agree with you on that one. I, I live by the maxim that action can overcome all. So if we can just take even the smallest of actions each day, it at least can propel us forward. It may not be the best action to take, but we're doing something, right? We're not staying in the same place where we always have stayed. We're doing something a bit different. And and I love that aspect of it. So you also talk about the formula for success and the freedom to enjoy it. In this section of your book, you are talking about, well, you, you reference the, sha- the shadow intelligence, and you combine that with IQ and EQ. But let's talk about what shadow intelligence is, and then explain that formula to us, if you will. So this idea of the shadow and shadow works, again, it sounds super woo and mystical, but if you boil it down, what's a shadow? When, you know, light is blocking, you know, when an object blocks the light, a shadow is cast. Okay, great. So psychological shadows are just anything that's blocked off of our awareness. And we all have areas where our awareness is not super clear which is why people can achieve great things and then go, I, I've done all the things. I've grabbed the brass ring. Why am I so unhappy? And it's like, because there are things about yourself that you've had blocked off from your awareness. And so shadow intelligence is the degree to which you're very comfortable and familiar with all the different aspects of yourself. For some people, their shadows are negative qualities. Like I would never be an angry person. It's like those are usually the scariest people because their rage becomes so shadow that it comes out in very suboptimized ways. But some people shadow positive things. I hear this when people say, I'm just not a take big risk kind of person. You know, I'm just not a creative person. I'm just not someone who can get things done. It's like, that is crap. You know, if, if you boil it all down, we all have the capacity given our relative safety and access to the things that we need if that's all solved for. We all have the capacity to do creative things and innovative things and do cool things and so we need to be aware what is it about you that that belief got there like why are you so disconnected from your own power why are you so disconnected from your own capacity or disconnected from your joy or from your rage and your anger or whatever but anywhere you have shadows psychological shadows there's going to be a barrier there which prohibits you from enjoying your life Like the goal of life isn't happiness, it's wholeness. Because the more whole we are, the more happiness we get as an output. So that's my argument for deal with all of it because happiness is the byproduct of wholeness. It's not the thing that we can then grab to feel whole. Feel whole first, happiness follows. Deal with all of it. So then the formula itself is IQ plus EQ plus SQ, shadow intelligence, Mm -hmm. equals the formula for success and the freedom to enjoy it. 
Right, because you can have success with a high IQ. You could achieve great things with a high emotional intelligence quotient. But if you have IQ, but you don't have emotional intelligence, you're going to be lacking. If you have emotional intelligence, but you don't have shadow, you need all three. We need the IQ, the intelligent, you know, the standard cognitive types of things. We need emotional intelligence. And we need intelligence about our own minds and befriending our brains and realizing our minds are on our side. Even the scariest voices in your head are there to help you, generally speaking. Yeah, that one, and, and I... I agree with you. That's a that's a difficult one at times for me to come to terms with. But when I get enough distance from it, from the thought or the feeling, whatever that happens to be, and I can get enough perspective, I can begin to see it differently. But in the moment, that that one can be a bit different to or a, a bit difficult for me to comprehend. I have a hack for that. Um, Anyone who has children or has raised toddlers will get this. You know, when your toddler says, I hate you, it hurts. But are you mortally wounded? You know, toddlers have tantrums and kids say stuff. But we know kids have a limited vocab. And when they say, I hate you, do they literally hate you? Does that mean for all time you are a terrible parent? No, it means they're having a big feeling. And that's what kids say. What if the inner critic you reframed not as a horrible boss or a mean parent, but like imagine your inner critic's a three-year-old. A three-year-old who's screaming, I hate you, you stink, is probably hungry or sleepy or in need of some attention. It takes the fear out of it. It takes the fear factor out of listening to what's happening in our heads. If you think of those voices as really terrified or hungry kids instead of mean parents with great power over you. Because they don't actually have power, their thoughts, until we give them power. Thinking of them as little kids or like a shelter animal that is biting and snarling because it's scared takes the takes some of the fear off of it so then you can work with it differently. That is such a great example. Thank you for sharing that. Love it. So I had read a quote at the top of the show. It was a quote by Wayne Dyer, and I'll just go ahead and restate that quote. You are not stuck where you are unless you decide to be. Do you agree with that quote? So, okay. The, the problem with the quote is if you're in an oppressive environment or you're subject to like genocidal forces or whatever, no, I don't agree with it. But let's assume for the time being that the person that we're talking about has relative safety and access to basic needs, then yes, and here's why. Stuck becomes unstuck, and you said this earlier, stuck becomes unstuck the second you say yes to anything, no matter how small. Stuck is no longer stuck if you are saying yes. A microscopic step forward is still a step forward, which renders you now unstuck. So assuming you have choices, yes, stuck then becomes an option because no matter how dire the circumstances, there's almost always a micro yes to be found. If you can't find one, then make the ones you're thinking of smaller until you can get to a yes. As soon as you get to a yes, you're no longer stuck. And then we build from there. Very good. Thank you for that. So what are you adding or eliminating from your life today to live more fulfilled and with greater purpose? Mm. Uh, I'm eliminating high conflict relationships. So okay. relationship conflict is inevitable, but high conflict boundaryless is drama is just no. I no. So that's going to the degree that I'm able to make choices. Um, and I'm really investing in my friendships and my relationships. And um, I have a wonderful marriage. My husband is fantastic. Um, we married later in life, so I call him a normie, meaning he has no addictions. When he's tired, he sleeps. You know, he'll have a beer and then be done. It's very strange to me that he just is like a normal person, just does things normally. It's, I mean, no one's perfect, but he's a happy person, and that's very cool to me. Um, so I really, really love the relationships that I've built, the healthy ones, and um, yeah, including the one with myself. Beautiful. They cost a lot, so I have high value for them. Mm. How did you meet your husband? Um, through mutual friends. So people who say you can't meet anyone without being on the apps, not true. Have not used a dating app. We've got a success story here. 
<laughs> it can happen. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So if you could ask one question of anyone who is currently alive or no longer with us, what first who would the person be that you would that you would want to ask the question of and what would the question be? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, if I could ask a question to anyone, anywhere, what would it be? Mm, I'd want to ask my future self who's laying on her deathbed, what do I need to know so you're not laying there with any regrets? Ooh, interesting. Have you read The Power of Regret? Daniel Pink, yes. not all of it, but I'm familiar with it. So okay. it can be powerful, but if I can bypass it all together by asking my deathbed self what I need to do, sure, I want to bypass it all together if possible. That is that is such a great question. Is there anything that your future self could say to you on the, their deathbed about regret that you wouldn't do? So if they said, this is what led to regret, and it was something just so outrageous, is there anything that you wouldn't do to, to not have to feel that? I don't think my future self would ask my present day self to do something that would be so fundamentally opposed to my willingness and my current belief system. So I, I trust her that whatever the answer is would probably be a-okay with the present day me. Brilliant response. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I wouldn't have expected anything less from you, Britt. So, <laughs> so we have all of your social handles. Obviously, we will put that in the show notes. We'll also provide a link to where everyone can go out and buy The Science of Stuck, which I highly encourage everyone to do. It is such a fantastic book. So two quick things. First, I would love it if you would give our audience and me a challenge. What would you challenge us to do? Oh, I love this. Um, find a micro yes right now. Don't wait till New Year's Day. Don't wait till next week. Don't wait till you have the special shoes or the good pens. Find a micro yes that you can do. The thing you say yes to in the next 90 seconds has limitless possibility waiting for you. So find a yes right now. Mm, that's a great one. All right, my friends, you heard it. I hope you're going to take Brit up on that one. That's a powerful one. And then begin to stack those micro yeses, but start with this first one. I love that. And then, Brit, here is my final question to you. What is one of the most valuable, unexpected lessons that you've learned from a client and how did it impact you? Okay, one of the most valuable lessons that I learned from a client unexpected. is my job as a th unexpected unexpected yeah. lesson that is you learned. My job as a therapist is not to heal, fix, or save, or even help. That's not my job. But, you know, being helpful is a great byproduct. But when I learned this unexpected, and this client died of an overdose. My job is not to help fix or save. My job is to be a witness and to give you the best information that I have and to help you find your own answers to the best of my ability and then to be 100% detached from your choices. That's the beauty of therapy. I'm not a parent or a partner or a friend. It's the only relationship as an adult where we can have a witness, an empathic, compassionate witness who has no dog in the fight and no stakes whatsoever in the game. That was an unexpected and a very important lesson. It's why I can do the work I do without feeling buried by it. That was so brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. Britt, Great question. I want to thank you so very much for joining us today on Business Minds Coffee Chat. What an incredible conversation. I have thoroughly enjoyed getting to know you, learning a bit about your, your backstory, 
learning about the trials and tribulations, at least some of them that you've experienced, how you've grown as a human being, the amazing work you do today, and the gift that you've given to all of us of not only this conversation, but also the science of Stuck. And I cannot wait to continue our conversation together and then to be able to enjoy the next pieces of of work that you bring to the rest of the world so thank you i'm grateful for you thank you so much can't wait to do this again thank you for tuning into business minds coffee chat your support helps us continue to bring you amazing guests please share the show with a friend and subscribe and leave a review on apple podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts Here's to your personal and professional growth.